In the previous lecture, we re revisited Maxwell's equations and around the end of the lecture I told you that Maxwell's equations in fact are the origin of the familiar Kirchhoff voltage and current laws. Maxwell's equations uh, can be written down under steady state and dynamical conditions. The equations under dynamical conditions are in fact four uh, experimental or rather laws which have emanated from experimental observations that is Gauss's law of electricity, Gauss's law of magnetism, Faraday's law and Ampere Maxwell law. And of course, these laws tell you what the electrical and magnetic fields are when you have got uh, charges and currents uh, in, uh, in the environment. And uh, once you get the electrical and magnetic fields, uh, you can actually using Lorentz force equation uh, find out the forces felt by these charges or moving charges. So, this is where we left off last, last time and uh, what we need to do is actually try to correlate between some of the things which we uh, learnt in Maxwell's laws and the circuit laws and in particular uh, learn a bit about typical circuit components and uh, what approximations go in when we uh, you know get uh, or, or we use real life materials to mimic uh, certain elements. Now, if you look at uh, Kirchhoff's uh, voltage law which really says that the sum of potential rises or, or you can even say the sum of prote potential drops in a closed loop equals to 0, it actually emanates from uh, Kirchhoff's uh, that is Kirchhoff voltage law emanates from Faraday's law and what you have if you look at Faraday's law, what we see is that it is expressed as a line integral uh, or in point form as a curl. So, curl of E uh, is equal to minus dB by dt or the line integral of E dot dl over a closed curve is equal to minus d by dt of the total electrical flux through the curve bounded by this curve. Uh, yeah, so I think I have uh, mistakenly said uh, electrical flux, it is magnetic flux. Now, uh, so if you look at under static conditions, or under situations where you have got a circuit or a uh, environment in which there is no magnetic field, this is true. So, if there is no magnetic field in a certain location or the rate at which the magnetic field changes is 0, in that case you can write curl of E is equal to 0 or the integration of E dot dl over a closed curve is equal to 0. Now, we also know that uh, under circumstances where this is equal to 0 or you can define a potential difference. So, this potential difference is phi a b which is nothing but the potential of a minus the potential of b is equal to sorry yeah it is ok. E dot dl this is how potential phi a b is defined. Now, this is called a potential difference. Now, if you are going over a closed loop you take any closed loop I will call this A, B, C, C, D, E. You can in fact get the compute E dot dl from A to B, then B to C, C to D, D to E, E to A and if you add them all up, it will come out to be 0 as a result of this law. So, under static situations that is where your rate of change uh, rather the rate of change of flux is equal to 0, magnetic flux is equal to 0 or 
if you are doing this integration in an area where there is no magnetic field in that case you will find E dot dl is equal to 0 which in fact you can write in terms of potential differences because of the fact that E dot dl is 0. So, this is phi a b phi b c phi d e and phi a e. So, if you add up all these things it turns out to be 0 and this is exactly what Kirchhoff's law states. So, Kirchhoff's law effectively is telling us that the potential uh, difference uh, uh, you know if you take the sum of potential differences in a loop uh, it turns out to be 0. So, this is uh, the origin of uh, Kirchhoff voltage law uh, it of course assumes that uh, there is no flux uh, in this loop and or the flux rate of change of flux is 0 in which case you can uh, you can in fact do this. Now of course, uh, one of the important points which you should uh, the magnetic flux here if it is 0 uh, then of course, this is true uh, or the rate of change of magnetic flux is 0 in this loop it is true. Uh, but of course, in real life it is difficult to arrange for this in uh, in real life any loop uh, if there is a current flow in this loop in fact, there is going to be a magnetic field because of Mag uh, Maxwell ampere law and because there is a magnetic field this will not strictly be true. So, any in fact, loop which you take in space uh, or if you take a wire and form a loop uh, you will find that that uh, because of the fact that uh, the flux changes within the loop there are some stray effects uh, because of the change in magnetic flux and therefore, strictly speaking uh, you can say that Kirchhoff voltage law is not valid. So, in fact, if you want to make it valid you will have to put some corrections to account for these stray fluxes which may which may be present in the loop. So, that is one important thing which you should remember. In fact, when we are going to do transmission line theory uh, you will actually have to model uh, the loop caused by the conductors which are conveying uh, you know uh, energy from one generating station to a load. Uh, the loop from formed by these transmission wires in fact, have a very significant amount of magnetic flux uh, in them and therefore, uh, you know in the loop formed by the conductors and therefore, you have to in fact, take into account the effects uh, we shall see later they are called inductive effects of the transmission system. So, uh, but if you take a very small loop or the rates of change are very slow or you assume that the magnetic flux density is very low in this loop uh, you know emanating out of this surface uh, bounded by this loop in that case you can in fact, uh, you know apply uh, Kirchhoff voltage law without bothering about this. The other law which we have is uh, Kirchhoff's current law and uh, the this is actually originated from uh, the current continuity equation or what we have said before that J dot d s which is actually uh, which is over a closed surface. Uh, if it is uh, it is equal to the build up of charge within the surface. So, in case the amount of current j dot d s is in fact, j is the current density d s is the uh, elemental area of the surface which you are considering. So, if you try to take out j dot d s or the flux of the current through a closed surface you will find that that is equal to the charge build up within the surface. So, if of course, if the current going out of a surface is more than the current going into a surface a closed surface you will have in fact, a decrease of charge within the surface. So, this is essentially uh, the origin of Kirchhoff's current law in fact, uh, let us let us consider three conductors uh, and there is a junction like this. So, you have got three tubes in which there is some current that is j is non zero here and if you take out the flux of the current through all this surface let us assume there is no current anywhere else, but within this conductor. Now, if you uh, look at the current flow within the conductor it is entering here uh, let us say you are you are finding out how much of the current 
is actually flowing through the surfaces ok and if the net of all the currents uh, going into the if all these currents are going into the surface there will be a build up of charge within it. But if you assume that there is no build up of charge then what this Kirchhoff's uh, current law states is that uh, sum of currents at a junction is equal to 0 ok. Now, it is not difficult to see why this is true because if there is no build up of charge j dot d s which is the total current entering a closed surface is equal to 0. So, if there is no build up of charge this is true. So, of course, again just like in the case of Kirchhoff voltage law is this true always the answer is no because uh, you can have a build up of charge uh, in a closed surface if that happens you will create a, because of the presence of the electrical charge you will also create an electrical field uh, and because there is an electrical field you will also have a potential uh, you know created between potential difference created between uh, points and you will see that this leads us to a specific element called a capacitor. But if we assume of course that there is no chance of any charge build up or the charge build up is very very low or the rate of charge of build up is very very low for all practical purposes you can assume that the sum of currents uh, entering a junction uh, is equal to 0 ok. So, this assumes that there is no charge build up at the junction. So, if you take this uh, you know this junction of conductors and there is no charge build up well then uh, the charge continuity equation really tells you that uh, the sum of current should be equal to 0. So, that is the origin of Kirchhoff's current law remember current law assumes that there is no charge build up this is not true in practice. In fact, you will find that almost all junctions uh, you know they you know you could have a charge build up and this is associated with another uh, circuit element which we shall also call capacitors. So, this is something we will discuss a bit later or shortly rather. Sir, the rule scalar law and the second integral is with respect to one. Yeah. One small mistake which I must which has just been pointed out uh, is that uh, this rho is a scalar this so this has been small mistake which has occurred here. Yeah. And this is of course, with respect to volume. So, of course, there is a small error here. Uh, which needs to be corrected. So, uh, we have come to now Kirchhoff's voltage and current law and we saw that it is actually uh, the application of uh, Faraday's law and the charge continuity equation under special circumstances where there is no charge build up or uh, when uh, there is uh, no magnetic flux density or uh, if the rates of change of charge build up or the rate of change of the flux density is so low that you can neglect it. In such cases you can directly apply Kirchhoff's voltage law. In case these assumptions are not true that is charge build up does occur at a junction or magnetic flux density exists within the loop there are approximate ways of modeling these when we do uh, any kind of analysis. And as we go along with this course we shall see that we will be able to model these things using uh, basic elements uh, which follow simple laws called capacitors and inductors. So, in this lecture uh, let us consider one by one uh, circuit elements and uh, the first one which comes to mind is of course, uh, the a resistor. So, this is a real life element. So, now so far we have been mostly talking of the laws of physics and we are talking of uh, you know uh, mostly idealized situations of free space mostly and also uh, you, know, uh, you know you can say a bottom of approach where you are talking at fundamental laws. But now we will look at real life elements and what we saw just a few moments ago was in fact Kirchhoff voltage laws and uh, Kirchhoff voltage and current law uh, and the whole point of course is when we are talking of application of Kirchhoff voltage law and current law we have to consider uh, you know what causes these voltage differences what causes these currents and for that we need to look at the Lorentz force equation again. 
So, what we will do in this lecture is uh, in the further part of this lecture is to understand one or two simple elements like resistors, capacitors and inductors, but more importantly we will try to understand how we can apply Kirchhoff voltage law. In fact, we will be uh, implicitly using these concepts, but when you are applying Kirchhoff voltage law or current law we need to know why car charges move or why do you have potential differences. So, for that let us just look at Lorentz force equation. What it says is that a charge experiences a force in case there is an electric field and or the charge is moving in a magnetic field. Now, what it implies is that there is some reason why uh, the charge will move and that is there is a electrical field and magnetic field which is present. Now, what it means also is that if you want a charge to move you need to have an electrical field or the charge has to move in a magnetic field. So, one of the ways you can create a force is try to move a charge in a magnetic field. So, for example, a conductor a rod a conducting rod if you move in a magnetic field the forces within will feel a charge and many of uh, for example, in a DC motor this is what happens the conductor in fact moves in a magnetic field and then the charges get a force because they get a force they move and move towards the ends of the rods and they will all start accumulating at the ends of the rods and because of that an electrical field is created. If the rod is now connected to a looped wire the conductor because there is an electrical field created the charges will move, uh, start rot uh, you know flowing in that loop. So, this is how you have these loops in which you can in fact apply Kirchhoff voltage law and current law and the forces which are created by these loops are in fact uh, obtained by charges being moved in a magnetic field or an electrical field being present. Now, when is an electrical field created? An electrical field is created in two ways. There are some ways in which if you are able to separate the you know all materials have charges and uh, uh, in their atoms and if you are in some ways able to uh, you know separate the electrical charges remember the atom is electrically neutral, but if you are able to separate the electrons from the ions you can actually make this uh, uh, you know material charged. So, if there is a way of separating out uh, the electrical charges in a material then you can create an electrical field. So, this is often done for example, in a battery the ions and electrons in fact start getting separated the ions positive ions and the negative ions in fact move to different locations in a battery the electrodes and that causes an electrical field. So, if you have any conducting path or any free charges they will feel the electrical field and move. So, if you connect a conductor to the electrodes within the conductor there are free charges they will move. So, that is one way of creating an electrical field. The other way of creating an electrical field is in fact, if you have got a changing flux in an area. So, by Faraday's law if the flux uh, in a certain region is changing then electrical field is caused. So, this is how electrical and magnetic fields uh, if you have got an electrical field or a magnetic field and a charge is stationary in an electrical field or moves in a magnetic field it will experience a force. Devices which create electrical and uh, you know uh, this electrical field or V cross B kind of effects are usually called electro EMF sources. So, these could be generators a battery uh, you know uh, these can in fact create uh, uh, an EMF. So, uh, even a solar cell because of photons impinging on the material uh, the electrical charges tend to separate or move and that causes a potential to develop across the solar cell and this effectively can be used uh, you know in case you connect something outside you can use it to have a current flow because an electrical field is created because of moving charges which are triggered by photons impinging on the atom which uh, uh, make the at the electrons move. So, this is essentially an electromotive force. Now, once you have got an electromotive force uh, that is an electrical field in a certain region let us assume that uh, nothing in the region is moving then the only way you can have a force is due to an electrical field. Okay. Now, suppose you have got this in a certain region a force. Okay. Now, this force uh, just this is an analogy which I am showing here which is from Resnick and Halliday's book. 
uh, if you have got a ball in a gravitational field okay, and uh, that ball falls down in a gravitational field, it kind of accelerates and falls to the ground. Now, the thing is if the same ball uh, is subjected to the gravitational force, but now it falls in a viscous fluid. In such a case, the charges will not accelerate, but flow eventually reach a kind of constant velocity in that in that liquid. Okay. So, if it is flowing through a viscous liquid, the flow of the charges in fact will become a constant speed. So, in a similar fashion if you got a conductor and because of external reasons that is you have got some generators or EMF sources which I just mentioned some time back. You have got you have created an electrical field and you place the conductor in an electrical field okay. and this electrical field is continually created. Then the charges within the conductor start moving and once they start moving uh, they ought to get accelerated, but in fact the conductor is more like a viscous fluid. Okay. So, what happens is the conductors uh, the charges within the conductor will of course, initially accelerate, but eventually they will drift at a constant speed that is because of the electrical resistance which they face in the material or those you can call it the electrical viscosity which is there in a conducting material. So, this is essentially a resistance. So, what happens is that you can have an electrical field in a conductor existing within a conductor which is causing forces, but the charges are not continually accelerating, but overall you know in an average sense the charges are all drifting. Of course, they have got random movements, but on the whole they are drifting at a constant velocity and the conductor is like a viscous fluid. Okay. So, uh, the charges instead of being continually accelerated they eventually uh, have a constant drift velocity and because of that uh, you will have in fact a potential difference because there is an electrical field within the conductor which is causing the charges to move. How is this electrical field created by some EMF or electromotive force which is creating this electrical field. Okay. This could be a battery which is a device which kind of pushes negative and positive ions to different parts of the electrode or it could be a generator. Uh, which is created a V cross B kind of uh, force and this force is being uh, felt by the charges within the conductor. So, this is essentially uh, you know the uh, way a current flows within a conductor. And of course, we, uh, this interestingly if uh, the potential difference which is E dot dl from point A to B is uh, called a voltage or the potential difference we shall use the word, word voltage which is actually nothing but the potential difference. So, we know Ohm's law which is effectively the current flow is equal to V by R. Okay. So, if you apply a voltage that will cause trigger a movement of charges these charges will in fact drift at a constant velocity because it is more like a movement in a viscous fluid. So, charges will eventually move at a constant velocity. And uh, what has been observed experimentally is that the current the total number of charges uh, flowing uh, through a surface in a given a, a in one second is actually proportional to the voltage and this constant of proportionality for such devices is in fact V uh, R the resistance. And it turns out that the resistance is equal to if you have got a tubular conductor then uh, the resistance is proportional to the length and inversely proportional to the cross sectional area. Uh, but of course, if you are talking of uh, an infinitesimal area in which the current is flowing, we can also talk of the current density at that point that is the current per unit area and that turns out to be uh, you know sigma into E bar. Remember that V by L is approximately uh, you know the electrical field uh, V by L is in fact the electrical field. So, if you are talking of infinitesimal distances and areas then V by L will actually come out to be the electrical field and uh, you know J will come out to be the current density. So, this is the point form uh, of Ohm's law. Yeah. Now, what about real materials? Real materials in fact uh, the resistivity, resistivity is uh, the reciprocal of sigma. So, what you have shown here in the previous slide was in fact 
the conductivity the resistivity is 1 by sigma and it's called got the uh, dimensions of ohm meter and uh, if you look at the resistivity this is something which you can try to you know kind of commit to memory because these are the things which an electrical engineer needs to know uh, the material characteristics at 20 degrees it turns out of course this resistivity is a function of temperature the resistivity in fact of copper is 1.78 to 10 raise to minus 8 okay so this is in ohm meter aluminum uh, copper is considered a good conductor, silver is also con considered a very good conductor, aluminum has got a conductivity of 2.65 into 10 raise to minus 8 and iron which is almost 6 to 7 times the resistivity of copper. Okay. Uh, nichrome which is a material used to make resistive materials uh, is has got a conductivity of 1.1 into 10 raise to minus 6. Now water is an interesting material, sea water or salt water has got a conductivity of 2 into 10 raise to minus 1 ohm meter whereas drinking water uh, can uh, you know the resistivity can in fact lie in a fairly uh, large range. So uh, the electrical water which comes uh, you know drinking water or tap water uh, resistivity is uh, can vary in a range uh, while if you take deionized water, uh, it is a very good, it is a, it's, it's a good insulator, it has got a very high resistivity. Okay. So deionized water is a high resistive material. Uh, we shall later on, because we are this course is about electricity supply system, we shall see that a ground or the earth is a very important uh, you know, uh, electrical component if I may use the word electrical component. Uh, so, if you look at the electrical uh, properties of soil itself, uh, it can be quite uh, you know varied. So, for example, alluvial soil or the fertile soil which you have, uh, its resistivity can be as low as 5 ohm meter. This is the kind of fertile soil which you will get in river beds and so on. And this uh, figure here 5 actually can become even 50. Uh, it all depends on how much moisture is present in the soil. So, typical values of uh, you know, uh, you know, soil resistivity could actually be, uh, you know, a typical value is 100 ohm meter. But alluvial soil, which is, uh, uh, you know, having moisture, can have a low resistivity of around 5. Of course, it's nothing compared to copper. Copper is uh, much, much more conductive than uh, uh, the earth. Uh, if you look at granite, uh, it is has got a resistivity of 1000. So, if you have got go, if you try to take the resistivity of the earth in a very rocky place, it is likely to be much much higher than uh, if for example, you try to take out the resistivity in a river bed which has got some moisture. Uh, we, uh, now, when I was uh, searching through some material, I saw that wood uh, has also got is also a resi you know can be considered a insulator, but only if it is dry, dry wood is a good insulator, but damp wood uh, the order it has got uh, resistivity of, uh, of a few orders below uh, an oven dry wood and air of course is a good insulator and silicon as you know is a semiconductor. So, it is it has got uh, the resistivity in between uh, a, a good conductor and an insulator. Uh, an interesting thing is uh, silicon has got a negative temperature coefficient that is if the temperature increases then uh, the conductivity in fact becomes slightly better. Whereas uh, in all other uh, the meta metals you will see that they have got positive temperature coefficient that is the resistivity increases with temperature. What is this temperature coefficient? Rho at a given temperature is equal to rho at a given temperature T0 into 1 plus alpha T minus T0. So, this alpha is the temperature coefficient, it has got of course, uh, the uh, dimensions of the inverse of degree, uh, inverse of temperature is degree Kelvin. Okay. So, this is essentially uh, the behavior of real life resistors and uh, uh, what we will do next is uh, 
can we just go back to the material characteristics. Uh, uh, one of the things I came across uh, when I was preparing for this lecture as I said was that damp wood and oven dry wood is has got uh, fairly different uh, there is a big difference between the temperature of such uh, you know uh, damp wood and oven dry wood. So, I thought uh, let us just try this out in a laboratory. So, uh, I will just show you a brief video of uh, uh, which in which we try to measure the temp uh, the resist the resistance of wood. Now, uh, while uh, this video will be started I must mention here that uh, the instrumentation used here is a multimeter and uh, uh, what we are going to try to measure here is a large resistance. So, a, a word of caution before you uh, try to uh, you know try to measure uh, the resistance is that the first thing you should look for any this is a multimeter which is of a particular make you can try to use any other kind of multimeter as well this is just shown as an example various ranges in which you can measure the resistance. So, for example, if your range of measurement is uh, 600 ohms then the error which the multimeter will show is uh, I cannot read it here it is 0.9 percent ok. Uh, whereas, if you want to measure very large resistances you can expect a 5 percent error for example, if you are in the 40 mega ohm range you can have a 5 percent error. So, uh, what I wanted to uh, tell you here is that before you do any experimentation or measurement be aware of the fact that the measurements you are making uh, using the instrumentation which you are using uh, you should know how much error you can expect. Now, this what I am going to show you in fact is not a very quantitative kind of experiment what I am going to try to show you is simply that the moisture present can affect the resistance. Unfortunately, uh, I did not have an oven dry uh, uh, wood uh, piece, uh, but uh, and also it is uh, the monsoon period in Mumbai. So, the wood itself is slightly absorb some moisture. So, uh, what we will in uh, we will do this experiment and we do not expect to have a very drastic change in the resistance of the wood, but we will see that there is certainly a perceptible change in the wood resistance uh, in the presence of excess moisture and less moisture. So, what we have is uh, ostensibly a dry piece of wood. Uh, in fact, I have used the wooden uh, base uh, of a knife switch. Uh, which is uh, then uh, we measure the resistance between two points uh, of this uh, wooden base. And uh, if you look at the measured value the switch is open. So, in fact, uh, the current flow if any is flowing through the wood and we try to use this uh, this fluke meter which you can use any other make of meter as well. Uh, but again as I mentioned please uh, be aware of what kind of errors you can have uh, in the measurement. It shows 20 mega ohm the, uh, the decimal point may not be visible to you very clearly, but it is showing a resistance of 20 mega ohm. And now what we will do is uh, we can start the video of course. So, you look at this uh, this switch is open. So, the current flow is essentially through the wooden platform itself and expectedly the resistance is around 20 uh, mega ohm. But of course, this could be have an error of more than uh, slightly more than 5 percent. So, what we are going to do next is uh, use a tap water and spray it on this uh, wood. So, even though the switch is open and uh, so if there is any current flow it will flow through the wooden platform. So, what uh, is going to happen is uh, after we spray uh, you know this spray this water in fact, the water has already been sprayed uh, the wood is slightly made damp ok. And one thing uh, which is perceptible uh, it makes a perceptible difference to the resistance which is now measured. 
So, if you notice uh, it is slightly damp and now the resistance is in fact uh, halved or even come even lower than that. In fact, uh, we also tried one more thing in fact, it has become one fourth it is yet to settle down we will just wait. Uh, although we did not really wet the wood it is just become a bit damp. Uh, the resistance is in fact fallen down to around 4.7 which is almost one fifth of the value which we had. So, remember damp wood uh, you know if a wood is damp uh, its resistivity decreases ok. So, this is something which uh, we could easily check uh, uh, using a simple experiment and therefore, uh, damp wood especially in monsoon season uh, it can uh, have uh, 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 the resistivity can be a bit lower than what you expect. In fact, wood is not generally used as a insulator uh, because of this reason it is not uh, not really a good insulator yeah. Now, we move on to another two other uh, components uh, one is uh, uh, capacitors and inductors, but before we go there uh, go there you can look at uh, typical practical resistors uh, you would have seen this in your own laboratory these are resistors which are fixed and of course, uh, the one on the right which is being pointed at is in fact, a resistance of relatively higher wattage the ones below uh, that are in fact, variable resistors. So, you can have variable resistors and these are used in various electrical circuits uh, or electronic circuits yeah. and of course, the rheostat is a variable resistance and this of course, is something which you have used. Uh, in your laboratory as well. So, they are these are the two examples of a practical resistor. Now, uh, what we will do next is try to understand two other components capacitors and inductors and uh, before we do that uh, let me just re uh, let me just uh, 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 let us just recall that one thing I mentioned when we were talking of Kirchhoff's voltage and current laws is uh, Kirchhoff law when it is stated the way voltage law is stated that uh, the states that the total sum of potential differences or uh, you know you can say the voltages in a closed loop uh, are 0 ok. So, if you have got uh, voltage rise somewhere there will be a voltage drop somewhere if you go around a loop and of course, one of the things which uh, was mentioned at that time is that this is in fact coming from Maxwell's equations and uh, this this law so to speak uh, or Kirchhoff voltage rule if uh, I may use the word rule instead of law uh, is applicable in the way I have stated only when we can define voltages uh, from point A to point B uh, in a very neat way and that is essentially possible only under static conditions that is when uh, the magnetic field is not present or the rate of change of it is very small. In such a situation you can use uh, Kirchhoff voltage law, but suppose we want to find out uh, we, uh, you know uh, there are elements in which there is a significant magnetic field and the magnetic field also changes and because of that uh, you have to apply Faraday's law with uh, by considering the rate of change of the magnetic flux and uh, for, uh, for example, let us consider a simple loop of wire in which there is a there is a significant B and there is a significant rate of change of B. So, just let us take a loop of wire. Let us for the time being uh, when we are talking of an inductor assume that there are no electrical fields in this uh, in this region uh, around a simple loop of wire. Now, this is not true. Uh, and we will try to relax these assumptions when we consider structures like transmission lines etcetera where these effects become very important. But let us assume that an inductor is uh, uh, you know a coil uh, consider a coil in which there are no electrical fields in the vicinity ok. This is of course, not true just, just uh, for the sake of argument let us just assume that this is true. Uh, we can of course, say that the rate uh, you know uh, we can assume that the rate of change of electrical fields is very low or the electrical fields are very very small ok. So, as an approximation let us assume they are 0 ok or the rate of change of those electrical fields are 0. In such a case, so let us consider coil 
and Faraday's law simply states that over a closed curve is d by dt of b dot ds and this in fact is the electric uh, the magnetic flux uh, over a surface which is bound by a closed curve okay so what we will do is let us consider as i mentioned some time back a closed uh, a loop a wire uh, which is there and what we will do is apply this faraday's law and if you are applying this faraday's law let us call this point a and b and uh, what does faraday's law say that you take a closed surface so the surface i will just show it in blue so i will take this closed surface this coil of wire of course i have got two terminals here but i will take this closed surface the blue is a closed surface uh, sorry a closed curve i am sorry so this is a closed curve and this coil of wire of course has got two terminals so the closed curve which you take uh, not only uh, it traverses the same path as this loop of wire but also is closed here okay now if you do this you will have uh, if you want to apply this law what it says is that e dot dl so e dot dl along a closed curve means e dot dl along this loop of wire plus e dot dl from a to b so it is like this is equal to from b to a along the loop so b to a e dot dl plus from a to b but this is not in the loop okay is not in the loop of wire so this curve is otherwise along this loop of wire but only in this region it is outside the wire okay but we have to consider a closed curve so we have to consider this region as well, this part of the curve as well of a closed curve now the thing is that this is equal to the total change of flux in this coil now this coil has got a flux uh, it could be because of two reasons one there is an external current flowing somewhere and because there is an external current flowing somewhere there is a flux in this okay or because there is a current in this loop of wire itself let us say it is connected to something else and this current is kind of entering this uh, entering here and going around this way because of this current there is a b here so this b can be caused by the current flowing through this loop itself or some loop externally okay now if you have got a current flowing through this loop it will cause a b here okay let us not for the time being consider any other source of magnetic field this magnetic field is created because there is a current in this loop why is the magnetic field created because you remember this law as well Uh, is is equal to j dot ds plus another term which is of course proportional to d by dt okay but we'll assume that there are no charges and electrical fields in this region or the rate of change of those charges or uh, uh, rate of change of the electrical field is very low so in that case b dot dl is equal to j dot ds so we can expect that because of this current here there will be an electrical magnetic flux here because there is a magnetic flux in fact if this current is doubled you will find that b is doubled okay let us assume that this is a region in which there is free space okay and this free space uh, if you in case you double j b will double okay so if this happens you will in fact you can show that in fact the flux here uh, b dot ds is the rate of change of flux is proportional to is proportional is a proportional sign is proportional to in fact di by dt because the same current let us say is flowing it is a steady current no accumulation of charges so this current is flowing everywhere in this wire so in fact 
you will find that this will come out to be proportional to di by dt because the flux is created by the current and if you double the current the flux also double so and uh, so effectively the rate of change of flux is proportional to the current okay and if you look at this this is in fact the electrical field which is created here so if you take this loop of wire and the electrical field which is created here is this okay and this is the electrical field along in this loop so what we actually find is that what you and if this e dot dl which is going into the loop is along the loop let us say there is no electrical field in the loop let us say it is a conducting wire which has got no resistance uh, and if that is the case uh, you will find that the electrical field inside the loop of con if this is a conducting wire then the electrical field inside the loop is 0. So what you will find is this part of e dot dl is 0. So what you have eventually is because of the changing magnetic field so as a result since we assume that within the conductor let us say the conductor is no resistance so the electrical field within the conductor is 0 so this e dot dl evaluated from b to a along this conductor is 0 then what we actually have is a to b e dot dl is proportional to minus di by dt. So what this, this implies of course that uh, this is in fact what we call as phi the potential difference phi b minus phi a this is called a potential difference and this potential difference uh, is equal to phi b a which is also called a voltage. So what we have is voltage v a b is equal to minus phi b a which is, which is proportional to minus d i by d t and this in fact v a b is equal to l d i by d t this constant of proportionality is called what is known as the self inductance this is a positive value uh, we did not take care very well of all the signs etc but uh, in fact it comes out to be a positive constant so this positive constant is called the self inductance of this wire so what are the uh, you know before we uh, because i want to show you some subtle aspects in the next lecture about an inductor what are the things which we should remember here what are the assumptions we made we we made an assumption that the electrical field is either very small in this vicinity of this wire or in fact uh, its rate of change is very small either of these two things are true the second thing is that we assume that there is no resistance in this wire so what you actually had was uh, e dot dl within the wire uh, is equal to 0 because if there is an electrical field and the resistance is 0 uh, then you will have infinite current because the resistivity becomes 0. So uh, we will assume of course that the E dot dl within the wire is 0. Uh, the second thing which uh, because of that when you applied Faraday's law we saw that the potential difference between point A and B comes out to be proportional to di by dt because I which is we assume again to be constant uh, because there is no charge accumulation constant along this loop is equal to uh, the, the current since it is steady and there is no charge accumulation in the loop it will cause a magnetic field because of uh, max, uh, Ampere's law. So this uh, B we assume is proportional uh, to the current flowing in fact if we double the current b will also double this is certainly true of free space and air but later on uh, but uh, materials some ferromagnetic materials it is not true but in cases where it is true you will get a constant uh, you know uh, your rate of change of electrical flux will be proportional to the rate of change of current 
because of uh, Ampere's law. So, eventually we ended up with VAB is equal to L di by dt. Now, the interesting thing is that with all these assumptions, uh, we get this rule and this L is called an inductance. Now, inductance is this kind of idealization which we have in case we make all these assumptions. Uh, we shall see in the next lecture that in fact, if you take a real life inductor, uh, how does it behave? Does it behave like this or does it behave in other ways? Uh, this is something we will do in the next lecture. In fact, we will try to see how an inductor behaves at low frequencies and high frequencies and for that we will in fact, have a nice experiment lined up for you.